This episode of Style Series Synopsis brought to you in Monochrome. Here we are, four RPGs in one video. What have I gotten myself into? So let's get this out of the way early. Many hardcore Final Fantasy fans are likely already thinking, hey, these aren't Final Fantasy games, why are you covering them? And that sentiment is mostly correct. These games are not technically part of the Final Fantasy series, and yet clearly they have the Final Fantasy title. For those that don't know, the Final Fantasy Legend games are actually the first three games in Square's Saga series, which some of you may recognize from the Saga Frontier games on the original PlayStation. The reason for the title change overseas was quite simple. People were familiar with the Final Fantasy brand and Square hoped that it would boost sales. That's usually where the story ends, but this Game Boy trilogy has far more in common with Final Fantasy than most would think. Or more specifically, it shares a key creator with a particularly infamous Final Fantasy upgrade system. I'm likely going to butcher this pronunciation, so uh, bear with me. <clears throat> Akitoshi Kawazu, the man behind the much maligned character upgrade system present in Final Fantasy II, went on to create the first two Saga games, and in doing so, continued breaking down JRPG conventions by making his games more about unique customization and open world exploration than about story. This is a mantra that would become more easily identifiable in the Romancing and Frontier Saga games, but it got its start on the monochrome brick. As for Final Fantasy Adventure, well, this is a bit more complicated. Final Fantasy Adventure is the first title in the Seiken Densetsu series, known outside of Japan as the Mana series. That's right, this Game Boy title is actually the prequel to the incredibly overrated Secret of Mana, which is easily one of the weakest games Square ever made during their Golden Age, but that's an argument I've already made in greater detail in a past article. In fact, I've already reviewed the entire Mana series in text form. For those interested, there will be a link in the description. Now I'm pointing this out not just as a plug, but to point out that I've already covered these games and they will likely never be covered in video format beyond what is seen here, because the majority of them are awful and I don't want to have to suffer through them again. Except for Psyche and Setsu 3 and Legend of Mana, both are awesome. Anyway, many fans are already familiar with Final Fantasy Adventure's true identity as a Mana title, but what many aren't familiar with is that it kind of actually was a Final Fantasy title to begin with. The Japanese title of Final Fantasy Adventure is Seiken Densetsu Final Fantasy Gaiden, which loosely translates to The Legend of the Holy Sword, a Final Fantasy side story. So yeah, Final Fantasy Adventure was retroactively made into its own series in the same way that Final Fantasy The Four Heroes of Light eventually became the framework for Bravely Default and Bravely Second. This gets muddied a bit more by the release of Sword of Mana, which was a Game Boy Advance reimagining of Final Fantasy Adventure, but with a reworked plot to make it fit into the Mana series lore. This leaves Final Fantasy Adventure sitting in an odd limbo. Its place in the Mana series has been made unimportant due to its lack of canon, yet it was only partially a Final Fantasy title to begin with. Now that we've gone through the history, it's time to talk about the critique itself. As many who've been following my content may have noticed, this video contradicts my usual philosophy. So far with style series synopsis, I've made it a habit to always play the best possible version of each entry, and all four games in this video have had four remakes, three of which are available in English through fan translations, and one which was actually localized. So, why did I stick with the Game Boy versions? Well, it comes down to semantics, really, as the remakes went back to using their original names, fully cutting their ties with the Final Fantasy brand. If I ever get around to playing the Saga series properly, I will cover the remakes then. Now that Romancing Saga 2 has been released in English, albeit for smartphones, that's actually a possibility. But for now, I'm sticking with the Game Boy originals, so let's start with the Legends trilogy. First things first, I was actually surprised to find out how well these games still look and sound. I mean, sure the Final Fantasy Legend was a bit simple looking, but still functional, and the graphics became more refined with each entry. A lot of the sprite work actually looks better than anything that Squared created for the NES. And look at the attention to detail, rivers that actually flow, the high level spell effects that look absolutely devastating. Maybe I'm just easily impressed, but I wasn't expecting for three early RPGs on the Game Boy to wow me with visual spectacle. I know there wasn't a great deal of competition for RPGs on the original Game Boy. You basically had Pokemon and that's all that people paid attention to. But the Final Fantasy Legend games only look marginally less impressive, and yet the last entry in the trilogy predates the first Pokemon game by five years. The music was equally as impressive, which is no surprise given that the first two titles were composed by Nobuo Uematsu, with a little help from the talented Kenji Ito for the second game. The third title had completely new composers. In fact, Final Fantasy Legend 3 had an almost entirely different development staff, we'll get to that soon enough. I'll just say for now that these two gentlemen, whose names I refuse to pronounce for fear of butchering them, did a great job of keeping the series standards high. It's highly impressive what the developers were able to accomplish given the Game Boy's limited capabilities, but the limitations definitely shine through in some key areas. 
The biggest problem with the trilogy as a whole is that it's just not user friendly. How am I supposed to know what these abilities do? Why is the character upgrade system so needlessly complicated and random? Wait, am I going the wrong way again? me, this encounter rate is terrible. Let me give you a more refined example of one such issue. These three games all but require having a walkthrough open just for the sake of sanity. Even simple interface aspects have been completely neglected. For example, in all three games, different weapon types have different damage calculations. Some weapons are based on strength, some on speed, some do fixed damage, some hit all enemy groups, but you have no way of knowing any of this without trial and error. Hell, forget weapon types. Why can't I even tell if one sword is stronger than another sword? There are no stat tables available in-game, so until you buy something, you have no way of knowing if it's worth your money or not. I mean, I guess you could argue that you can make an educated guess based upon how expensive an item is, but it's still quite daunting and ridiculous. I know that the first couple of NES Final Fantasies have this problem as well, so I'm not trying to be unfair here, but these sort of ease of use improvements were essential to making games less frustrating for future play, and it's why they've been rectified in every re-release since. Another way in which all three of these games are hampered by their hardware is in the storytelling. I've discussed in the past how Square had trouble fitting translations onto NES carts, so imagine the combined difficulty of dealing with little cartridge space and a small screen. The translators did the best that they could, and the games are certainly playable, but the scripts are so truncated that I could not get invested. None of the stories are particularly interesting anyway, as we will see when we get to each individual game, but it is worth noting up front that they all suffer from hardware limitations. On the positive side, however, the trilogy has a good, challenging level of difficulty. All three of these games represent the few times where I would strategically choose my targets and abilities during the random battles to minimize damage, which, let's face it, is something that a lot of JRPGs from Final Fantasy VII onward have made completely unnecessary. Of course, this trilogy's difficulty is highly dependent on the parties you choose to build, but if you attempt to make a well-balanced party, you shouldn't have too much trouble, or surprisingly, even have to grind very much. With one exception, which we'll get to when I talk about the first Final Fantasy legend. All that being said, for the most part, these games play like your standard turn-based JRPGs. You travel from town to town, dungeon and back, dealing with swaths of random enemies. If you're watching my channel, and especially if you're watching this particular video on more obscure titles, I'm assuming you know the basics of old school JRPGs, so in the interest of saving time as I talk about each game individually, I'll be skipping all of that and instead focusing on what makes each title unique to JRPGs and also unique to each other. Final Fantasy Legends' premise is decent yet simple, following four customizable heroes whom scale the tower to paradise, basically adventuring for the sake of adventure. The players soon come to discover that several floors of the tower contain doors to alternate worlds for the player to discover and explore. This makes the story play out as a series of vignettes, none of which are particularly interesting or will be covered in great detail here, but there is one interesting aspect of this plot I'd like to discuss. Now, this will be the only story that I spoil in this video, so I suppose if that's going to bother you, you can skip to this point in the video. I feel the need to talk about this story in more detail than the others because of its historical significance to the genre, and also because it is unintentionally hilarious. I can't properly put into words how funny this is, so um, I'll let a professional comedian do it. The worst premise ever of any video game ever? Final Fantasy Legend for Game Boy. First one. Oh my god, it's kind of role-playing. You get to pick four companions, you go to five different worlds, you meet the heads of those worlds and kill them. And then, you get to meet God. And God is a tiny Amish man on the Game Boy screen. And then, you kill God. And that's the worst premise ever! In all seriousness, despite how painfully hammy this villain is, this marks the first time that a JRPG ever used the We Must Defeat an Evil God plotline, which as fans of the genre know, is a commonly used trope, for better or for worse. Speaking of firsts in gaming, Final Fantasy Legend holds the distinction of being the first handheld role-playing game ever made, making it an incredibly important historical landmark. But boy, does it show its age. The first thing players are likely to notice about Final Fantasy Legend is that the game offers three different character classes to choose from. Humans, mutants, and creatures. The second thing the player is likely to notice is that the character growth is determined not with experience points, but in different ways depending on which of the three character classes you are using. And they all have rather unfortunate results. May I remind you that we are dealing with this guy. The same one responsible for Final Fantasy II's leveling system. And that'll probably tell you what we're in for. Another admittedly unique and interesting idea that staggers horrendously when it comes to the execution. Humans only gain stat bonuses based on purchased items, namely potions which grant permanent stat boosts and of course temporary bonuses based on what equipment you have on. This means that human skill is based entirely on wealth, which is a statement that is so depressing analogous to real life that I refuse to delve into its implications any further or else risk putting myself into a week-long depressive state. 
state. This makes humans potentially the most powerful class in the game, but at the expense of a lot of grinding. It's enough of a pain to level up one efficiently, but if you're thinking of using two or more, well, I hope you're a patient person. Even with that in mind, this is the least frustrating of the three classes to power up, because it at least is straightforward. Let's try delving into the other two, shall we? Mutants are the Saga series equivalent to mages, as they are the only class that can naturally use magic. Which would be fun if the mutant class didn't rely on arguably the stupidest character growth mechanic ever put into a video game. After every battle, you have a chance of earning either a random stat upgrade or a new ability. The random stat growth is poorly implemented in itself, because unlike Final Fantasy II, it is truly random and not based upon the actions you take in battle. This means that you have an equally likely chance of gaining health or strength as you do gaining magic. Your character development is based entirely on luck. That's not even the worst part of it however, as things really become painful when you add in the ability system. Abilities in this game are handled almost identically to the Pokemon games. You can have up to four, and they each rely on charges instead of an MP pool, which is fine. But as I stated earlier, abilities are randomly learned, and when you do happen to get one, it replaces one of your previously learned abilities without any player input. This system means that you can theoretically learn an endgame ability after your first battle, and then have it replaced by an ability that is completely useless one battle later. These four slots aren't just filled with actions either, they can be filled with inactive abilities like resistance to poison, for example. And all of this is, once again, up to the RNG gods. I had to save after every single battle for fear of losing my mutants more powerful abilities, and it forced a number of game resets, believe me. I don't know what the devs were going for here, but this system is awful. Lastly, we have the creature class, which is this game's most unique element. Creatures cannot equip weapons or armor, and their stats and abilities are completely unchanging, and thus they make a full transformation. Monsters transform by eating the meat that is randomly dropped by your enemies when they are killed. The problem with this system is that you have no idea upon eating the meat if your creature will get more powerful or revert back to a weaker form. Once again, making it so you either have to have a chart open at all times or you are just gambling. Creatures are inoptimal party members anyway because their strengths are capped based upon what the best possible monsters are, while humans and mutants can continue to grow in power. I hated using creatures my first time through, and I hated them just as much my second time. As far as other series-specific oddities go, the game also makes use of a weapon durability mechanic and a limited inventory system, both of which were mechanics that I feel will annoy the majority of gamers, but I actually kind of liked it. It helped create a more stable difficulty curve that I enjoyed, or at least as stable of a difficulty as you can get when so much of the character growth is based on luck. If what I've said already hasn't scared you away, this just might. Final Fantasy Legend is infested with bugs. Magic resistances don't work properly, damage calculations for certain abilities are incorrect, stats can roll over the stated max of 99, some spells literally do nothing. The worst defender of all is that you can instantly kill the final boss with the chainsaw weapon, which I refuse to take advantage of. The entire game, from a technical standpoint, is a mess. I feel bad about being this harsh towards Final Fantasy Legend. I really wanted to enjoy it given its prestigious place in history as the first handheld RPG, but more often than not, I was either bored or frustrated while playing. I recommend it only to those who are patient and those who are interested in historically important games. Final Fantasy Legend 2, on the other hand, takes the formula established in Part 1 and refines it into an enjoyably playable, though still flawed, experience. Final Fantasy Legend 2 follows the player-selected main character in their search for their father. Along the way, you hear rumors of 77 magi, this game's plot MacGuffins, that must be collected and used to travel to different worlds, which will hopefully lead the player to finding their father. Simple, but a good enough excuse to get the player adventurous. Legend 2's gameplay follows in the footsteps of the first game, but thankfully fixes a lot of the major annoyances from that title, especially when it comes to character growth. Humans and mutants can now both increase their stats through battle. Instead of the bonus being random, it's now based upon what type of actions the player took to during that battle, making for a more refined version of what Final Fantasy II was attempting to do. The mutant ability problem has also been fixed. While abilities are still randomly learned after battle, they only replace the ability in one particular slot, and since the player can arrange the ability order in any they'd like, they can guarantee the safety of at least three spells at all times. The game also introduces a new class in the form of the robot. It's a great addition that offers unique and welcome mechanics that made it my favorite character to play as. I spoke briefly about the durability mechanic when talking about the first Final Fantasy Legend, but robots make it less of an issue. When you equip a robot with any weapon, the total number of uses is cut in half, but it causes the weapon to function like the mutant spells do, replenishing them each time you rest at an inn. The robot also raises its stats differently than humans and mutants do, with equipment being the only means of raising stats but the stat boosts being much larger for them than they would be for any other class. 
The only other real change is the use of the aforementioned Magi, which all serve different functions. Some are equipable for temporary stat boosts, for example, while others have more utility uses, but it offers just enough variation to make the game feel fresh in comparison to its predecessor. The new mechanics do come with at least one major problem of their own, however. There are, once again, multiple weapon types in this game. The two main types I'd like to discuss are the ones that calculate damage either based upon the player's strength stat or the player's agility stat. The game is structured so that it's not logical to choose the former over the latter. Strength affects only the damage output of certain weapon types, while speed governs damage calculation, turn order, and defense through evasion. And since you level up based upon what actions are taken in battle, focusing purely on upping agility gives the player such a large advantage that is nearly broken. Honestly, I don't have a lot to say about Final Fantasy Legend 2, except that it succeeded at being what Final Fantasy Legend was trying to be. It's a unique take on the standard JRPG formula without the debilitating bugs and reliance on RNG that made the first game so insufferable. If I were to make a comparison, I'd say that it falls into the same sort of realm as the Dragon Guard series does. Some people will enjoy it for its uniqueness alone, but it still doesn't quite reach a mark of high quality in terms of execution or design. This one may actually be worth a look. I certainly enjoyed it, but I can't give it a glowing recommendation. And finally, we have the Final Fantasy Legend 3. The premise behind Final Fantasy Legend 3 takes a turn for the generic. The big bad wants to destroy the world and you have to stop it. Big shocker, right? The only even remotely interesting thing about Final Fantasy Legend 3's story is that it relies on time travel as a mechanic. But this certainly isn't 999 or even Chrono Trigger in terms of storytelling. Final Fantasy Legend 3 is the most conventional JRPG of the trilogy, bringing back experience points and throwing out the weapon durability mechanic entirely. The game also gives you a pre-designated cast of characters to play as, though they have no real personality or skills beyond two being more suited to be spellcasters and two being more well suited to be warriors. But on that same note, this game is the only one of the trilogy that I feel can be reasonably completed without a ridiculous amount of trial and error or a walkthrough. I still recommend a weapon and armor chart at the very least to make things more palatable, but overall, getting through the game is not as an impossible a task as it was previously. This makes Final Fantasy Legend 3 easier to recommend on a casual level, but it achieves this by throwing out almost everything that made the saga games unique in the first place. Character transformations are the only mechanic that carries over, but they're completely unnecessary, as the game can be beaten with just your default party of two humans and two mutants. And after seeing what a mess the systems were in the last two games, I honestly felt like it wasn't worth the struggle of studying an entirely new transformation chart to make use of the cyborg or creature classes. Even the weapon durability is gone here, and with it the use of spell charts which has instead been replaced with your standard MP pool. Polish, in this case, came at the expense of creativity, and I'm not sure how I feel about that in this case. Legend 2 was such a huge step up from the first title that I feel like a third attempt would have been enough to fully iron out the problems that had plagued the first two, but instead, the ideas were just abandoned. These changes can be attributed to the fact that this title was created by an entirely different development team, and Akitoshi Kawazu was not involved in the project at all. Instead, this game was created by the team that would later be responsible for the often maligned Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, and while that may have some people running for the hills, it shouldn't, as this is a decent RPG, thanks mostly to its smooth difficulty curve, good pacing, and excellent dungeon design, all three of which were elements that the previous Legend game lacks. I was incredibly surprised to see how well exploration was handled in this game, from utility spells that give different means of traveling, to the excellent dungeon design which has players solving minor puzzles due to dungeon gimmicks, or making strong use of the game's jumping mechanic. Oh, oh yeah, this game has a jumping mechanic. No more getting stuck behind NPCs! I enjoyed the combat of all three Final Fantasy Legend titles thanks to the difficulty, at least from the encounter it wasn't giving me a battle every three steps, but Legend 3 is the only title that I can honestly say had me enjoying the actual dungeons themselves. Because of this, Final Fantasy Legend 3 is technically the best of the trilogy, or at the very least has the best pacing, most creative level design, and the smoothest user interface, but it doesn't really feel like a saga game anymore which for some people may be a good thing. Those looking for a Final Fantasy feel will feel more at home here than in the previous two titles, and if you're willing to look past the hardware limitations, Legend 3 can be a good way to spend 10 hours. The Final Fantasy Legend trilogy is as ambitious as it is clunky, as unique as it is unpolished, and with that in mind, it's sort of a crapshoot when it comes to recommending these games. I've played this trilogy all the way through about three times now. My first time through I was far from impressed, and if I'm being honest, I still don't care much for the first Final Fantasy Legend, but Legend 2 and 3 kept me reasonably entertained once I realized how they're supposed to be played. It takes an incredibly dedicated gamer to enjoy these titles, as you either need to have the patience of a saint or play with a walkthrough guiding you every step 
step in the way. And I can't in good conscience claim that that's good game design, but if you are deeply entrenched in RPG history, I can't deny that these games are worth a look simply because of what the developers were trying to accomplish and how much of that ambition was actually realized given the incredibly limited hardware of the time. So in a nutshell, they are interesting games. I mean, come on, name another series that lets a player equip their mages with submachine guns and laser pistols, but I hesitate to call them good games, which is in direct opposition to my feelings regarding Final Fantasy Adventure. As I stated in the history section of this video, I've already reviewed the entire Mana series. That included a side-by-side -side review of Final Fantasy Adventure and its reimagining, Sword of Mana. At the time, I can admit I was a bit harder on Sword of Mana than I should have been, but stated that Final Fantasy Adventure was a far better game. And that is something I do still believe. In fact, Final Fantasy Adventure is so well constructed that I had a hard time putting it down while recording footage for this review. The story is, once again, fairly standard. You play the hero as he attempts to stop the Dark Lord. Yes, the, the Dark Lord, from destroying the Tree of Mana. This was the only Game Boy title in this video where I was even vaguely interested in the plot. It was still hampered by the Game Boy's limitations, but it had a few memorable moments that I won't spoil here. Don't set your expectations too high, but I think some people will actually enjoy it, and others, at the very least, will find it concise enough to not drag down the game's pacing. In terms of presentation, Final Fantasy Adventure's graphics aren't likely to wow you, but they are crisp. Everything is easily distinguishable, even on a small screen, and since this is an action title that is far more important here than it was in the Legend trilogy. The most impressive thing of all, however, is the sound design. The game actually uses sound as a gameplay mechanic, making better use of audio cues than the vast majority of video games I've ever played. Different sound effects will alert the player to when their attacks against enemies are effective, ineffective, or if there is a breakable wall, all three of which are incredibly important elements in this game's design. And of course, the music is great, this time being composed entirely by Kenji Ito, who would later become the main composer for the Mana series that followed. In case it hadn't been made obvious already from the footage on screen, Final Fantasy Adventure takes heavy inspiration from The Legend of Zelda, from its screen-to-screen -screen movement to the way exploration and combat is handled, but it adds in some RPG elements that give the game its own flavor. Combat is a basic hack and slash affair for the most part, but the game does spice things up with enemies that are resistant to certain weapon types, the use of magic for both offensive and defensive purposes, and your charge attack meter. Now, I hated the implementation of the charge beater when I first started playing the game, because it filled so slowly I thought it was going to be useless. But as you level up, so does the speed of the charge bar, which eventually makes those attacks a viable combat option while also giving the player a more visceral means of judging how much more powerful they become than simply doing more damage. Speaking of becoming more powerful, Final Fantasy Adventure makes use of the standard experience point system that gives the player the option of choosing what stats become more powerful at each level, offering at least a bit of customization to the mix. Whether out in the world or crawling through dungeons, you are met with many interesting roadblocks and puzzles that add depth to what could have been left as a stale hack and slash title. For example, weapons and magic have practical uses outside of battle, for flipping switches, breaking walls, crossing large gaps. The way in which progression happens feels incredibly natural thanks to this, and solving these puzzles felt satisfying. The puzzles struck a remarkable balance. They were never too opaque to halt my progression, but they weren't so simple that they felt tedious either. Now, I will admit that it can be quite easy to get lost, but the same is true of most games in the genre, even Legend of Zelda itself. If you do get stuck, you can always check a walkthrough, which may sound hypocritical given what I've already said in this video. To me, there is a huge difference between needing to glance at a walkthrough because a player gets stuck once or twice, and a game being so complicated or obtuse that they need to have one open at all times. I was able to go through this game just fine without one, but I will admit I got dangerously close to giving into temptation when I wasn't sure how to reach my next destination about three quarters of the way through the game. And sadly, I feel compelled to warn you that Final Fantasy Adventure does have one glaring flaw. The game's use of keys and automatically relocking doors in the dungeons makes it possible to get yourself permanently stuck inside of some dungeons, forcing the player to restart the entire game from the beginning if they're not careful. It's easy enough to work around, just make good use of both save slots and always be well stocked on keys, but the fact that this issue needs to be worked around at all is unfortunate. Taking into account everything I've said here, I can still wholeheartedly say that Final Fantasy Adventure is a legitimately great game, easily the best of the four Game Boy Final Fantasy titles, and I recommend that you play it if you enjoy this kind of gameplay. And if you have a Vita, might I suggest the game's remake, Adventures of Mana. It is nearly identical in terms of gameplay and dungeon layout, but it's rendered in 3D, and it makes use of the console's extra buttons and touchscreen to cut down on menu navigation. Oh, and of course the game's in color, but I'm just not showing that here for consistency's sake. Now I must remind you that this is not to be confused with the previously mentioned Game Boy Advance reimagining Sword of Mana, which is an okay 
4K game that vastly expands the lore and changes the combat in its entirety to be more in line with the rest of the Mana series, but it does suffer from bloated dialogue, pointless fetch quests, and overly complicated equipment upgrade systems. If you are interested in the Mana series lore, then Sword of Mana is a game that is technically considered canon, so that's something to keep in mind. The fact that these two drastically different versions of the game exist is very interesting, and it's one of the best examples of the difference between a remake and a reimagining, but that's a discussion for another video. The point is, Sword of Mana is fine, but Adventures of Mana, or hell, even the original Final Fantasy Adventure, is a game that truly deserves being played. And there you have it, my take on the four Game Boy Final Fantasy titles. That are kind of Final Fantasy games, but not really. They are an interesting part of the series' history, if nothing else, but after playing them all again, it's no surprise that not many others have experienced them. Except Final Fantasy Adventure, seriously, get on that. I know these videos have been coming out slowly, but it's crazy to think about the fact that I've now covered 10 Final Fantasy games. Of course, we have the four in this video, then we have Final Fantasies 1 through 3, Final Fantasy Explorers, World of Final Fantasy, and that huge Final Fantasy 15 video. Even so, I've still barely skimmed the surface of this massive series. Next time on Style Series Synopsis, I'll be taking a look at a classic, Final Fantasy IV. I hope to see you all there. Hello everyone, thank you all so much for watching once again. If you liked this video, please like, share, comment, subscribe. I absolutely love reading you guys' comments. I don't think you realize how much it brightens my day. <laughs> uh, aside from that, got some other videos up on the screen that you can click on if you want a little bit more. And you can also check out Super Game Reviews where we got some more stuff going on. Anyway, thank you again. See you later.